In this chapter, we want to look at the relationship between attitudes and behavior. A really, really important uh, relationship for all psychology, but for social psychology in particular, is something that kept us busy for 30 more or more years. Uh, now, um, a lot of us, a lot of social psychologists doing research on these things. So um, remember that when I started talking about why do some people think that basically social psychology should be all about attitudes, Gordon Alport, I said in the beginning, and why do we devote so much time to studying attitudes the reason for this is is that we believe that if your attitudes towards something is either positive or negative this will be a really good predictor um, for your behavior yet uh, in the last 30 40 50 years that we are doing research on that we find out that the complete the relationship between attitude and behavior is a little bit more complicated it's not as uh, straightforward um, let me kind of start with what we started with this lecture when i told you about this study by Lapierre, right? Just to kind of uh, remember what he did as a sociologist, what he did, it was like, okay, he uh, went with this Chinese couple, so a couple around in the US. I think they visited probably like 30, 40, 50, I can't quite remember, restaurants in the US and wanted to see if they would be served. So you were like, hmm, that's a weird study. But at that time, uh, uh, there was a really strong anti Chinese sentiment within the American uh, population. So it wouldn't be super surprising if these re restaurants would reject the Chinese cup and say that we don't serve Chinese people in our restaurant. However, this is not what Lapierre finds. I think out of the, basically out of the restaurants, all but one serve them food. I mean, one is one too many, but still, uh, I think he was surprised by that. And especially when he started, like thereafter, he came home and then he started an upcome the weeks thereafter to call all of these restaurants and ask them. He said, like, what is your attitude to Towards chi um, serving Chinese uh, people in your restaurant, for instance, if I would come with a Chinese couple to your restaurant, would you serve us? And basically, now it flipped. Basically, everyone that they that he called said no, we would not. So they had a really negative attitude to uh, these uh, like serving food to Chinese couples. Yet, when it actually came to action, they did not. Uh, uh, refrain from doing so, yeah, but they serve them food. So this is kind of like in the beginning, it just kind of showed us a little bit about this idea that there might be at times this disconnect between attitudes and behavior. So even though we hope for a strong relationship as psychologists, as social psychologists in particular, it's not always the case. And now we want to dig a little bit deeper into and trying to understand why. What could be factors that explain the lack of correlation between the attitude and the behavior? One of the very early kind of empirical reviews on that topic was by Eisen and Fishbein. I mentioned it earlier when I talked about measurement. And here they kind of um, emphasized, yes, in general, there's this relationship between attitudes and behavior. It is there, it's consistent, it's not as strong overall as we hoped. But there are certain conditions where you can say, okay, under these conditions, once they're met, the, co uh, the correlation between attitude and behavior will be much, much stronger. One of them I already mentioned, which they pioneered in this um, uh, empirical review here is this correspondence uh, 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 principle to say like okay the f better the fit between the attitude and the behavior the stronger the relationship so if I want to predict whether you will come next week to my online lecture I should ask you about your attitude towards coming next week to my online lecture not to online lectures in general to my lectures in general to me as a person to learning no about the specific behavior so if there's a stronger correspondence between attitude and the behavior you will have a stronger relationship yet this relationship is still, even if there's a strong uh, correspondence, far from perfect. So why is this so? One of the things that people then started to do is develop theoretical frameworks for better understanding how attitudes relate to behavior. So here you see the be uh, theory of plant behavior, which is probably the most famous and uh, most enduring theory about how attitudes and other components predict behavior. Eisen, which you know from Eisen and Fishbein, he had a, a, a theory of reasoned action he developed then with Fishbein, and then he kind of formed the theory of plant behavior. 
behavior, probably in many areas, the most influential theory in applied psychology, especially in health psychology or in any type of intervention psychology. Um, so it's a really influential uh, theory. And the idea here is basically that he says, well, if we want to predict behavior, then the best predictor of this behavior is the intention. So if the intention is basically, if I ask you, um, uh, do you agree that you will come to my next online lecture, right? This is, I will come to Andreas next online lecture. This is the intention. I formed a goal. I want to go there. And he says like, this is the strongest predictor of behavior. Okay. So what does predict what uh, what factors predict the intention obviously we have the attitude but we have also these other two factors so one of the key ideas here is like okay so first there's the attention that has to be shaped that has to be formed and no, attitudes are not just the only predictor of that but let's dig a little bit deeper into trying to understand what we know about what type of attitudes we need to have a strong relationship between attitudes and intentions okay um, so one of the things we talked about already was the correspondence principle for uh, predicting your lecture uh, like your lecture attendance right um, it's a really good one the other one we talked about attitude strength and ambivalence right so attitude strength would be one thing where it's like okay Let's say I ask you, how much do you want? How much do you like to attend Andreas, uh, uh, like the seminars? Let's take the seminars on Fridays. And it's like, oh, I very much uh, like it, right? And I think they're awesome. Obviously, you do. Um, and I, I, I like to come. And so you have a really positive attitude towards these seminars, but you might hate to commute, right? And now the, the whole attitude towards attending becomes more ambivalent. You're just like, I love being there, but I hate going there. So now you have this ambivalence. So if I only measure one or the other, right? We had that. If I don't respect the ambivalence, that there are some positive and negative feelings um, laying, then uh, I might over like find a very weak relationship between attitude and behavior. And the reason for that that is that there's more ambivalence to it, right? So a lack of ambivalence also translates into a stronger attitudinal strength. And so this would be then a better predictor of um, uh, behavior. So if there's a real a lack of ambivalence, a real strong attitude towards an attitude object, then you will have a stronger correlation between attitude and intention, according to Eisen and Fishbein and others. And this will then predict the behavior. There are other things that they identified that really help us to better understand why people can I see if I can I can obviously not uh, get the pointer, but why people um, uh, like why sometimes an attitude really strongly predicts the behavior and why sometimes not. So one thing they found the research found is that here on the left, if you have a strong self interest in performing the behavior if this is really like your attitude is basically based on a really strong motivation because it gives you something you really want then there will be a stronger correlation between your attitude and your behavior right so if there's something that kind of like in terms of a monetary incentive or whatever status uh, etc something you are really interested in if you can get that out there and this is the driver of your positive attitude then this will more strongly relate uh, predict your behavior the other one if it's it's more strongly related to your identity. We talked about uh, attitudes and identity and how attitudes form a kind of like a core component of our identity. But here you can think, okay, so if people um, feel that a certain behavior is part of their identity, right, uh, then um, this might be a, like me, a much better predictor of um, their behavior than if it's not. So you can think about something where it's like, oh, um, I don't know. Like, let's say you're really uh, a divine about uh, religious person that's really part of your identity uh, and uh, then uh, like performing certain re religious um, uh, behaviors like praying, attending festivals, going to church, mosque or synagogue, etc. Um, will be much better predicted by your attitude than it is if there's some person who's like, oh, I don't know, I kind of like Christmas, but I'm also not really Christian, so I don't know. And hence, the attitude will be uh, weaker in itself, but it will also not be connected to their identity, and hence there will be uh, less of a uh, predictive value for these attitudes. And the third one is 
information. So how how much information do you have that kind of supports your attitude, right? We talked a little bit about this at the end of chapter three, I think, where we just kind of search and defend, right? If you really had to defend your attitudes a lot, if you have to kind of defend yourself, why are you, why do you like this anime over that anime? Why do you like this football club over that football club? Why are you a psychologist and not a sociologist or a philosopher, etc.? If you had to have that argu these arguments a lot, if you uh, uh, thought about it a lot, if you uh, did a lot of research, then while you have effectively the same attitude, but it kind of stands on a stronger foundation, um, then your attitude will be a much better predictor of your behavior than for somebody who's like, ah, oh, yeah, I think, oh, yeah, 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 kind of, I like psychology, never looked into sociology or philosophy, but I kind of like it. Um, so then it will be like a weaker be a predictor of behavior. So these are three factors that kind of impact the attitude strength, that impact also the strength of the relationship between the attitude and the behavior. Another factor which we come excessively to when we talk about um, uh, social influences are norms, right? And so basically the idea here would be that sometimes you might have a really positive attitude, and this is the idea that theory of plant behavior puts forward to, and which has a lot of uh, uh, research in support of it. And I think like, oh yes, I really have a positive be attitude towards behavior, but I think people around me who I value wouldn't like me to do that. So you can th think about, let's say my son and my son is like oh he's really interested in wearing a skirt he's like our oh, skirts look cool i want to kind of walk around and they might be flirty uh, kind of like yeah it might be a really cool feeling um and i'd like to try to wear a skirt but i think my father might disapprove or my fellow other the other students in my school might disapprove or my sister might disapprove so people around him he might have the impression that we would disapprove of that and hence he might refrain even though he really wanted to right easy to um, uh, kind of imagine that so that's another reason why even if i have a positive attitude if the norms are not in line with the attitude then we will not find a very strong correlation between attitudes and behavior because the norms are in the way okay the third component could be that i think oh yes it's it's uh, i'd love to uh, wear a skirt well a skirt is not a great example here but let's say i would love to upload my videos in a timely manner and uh, i think that the students that are really important to me would like that if i would upload my videos in a timely manner um but oh now there's like this kind of what's often called behavior control this is a component that was added in after albert bandura's research on self-efficacy which is basically can i perform the behavior do i think i have the ability the aptitude to perform this behavior and i if you would ask me yes i want to upload my videos very much in a timely manner. I think that uh, the people around me um, would very much approve if I would upload my videos in a timely manner. But I feel like sometimes I can't. Sometimes I have to do other things that come in the, in the way of that. So if you ask me, how strongly do you think you have the ability to always upload your videos in a timely manner? I would say, eh, right? Um, not so much. Here, I think I have on the next slide, oops, uh, the example of like Android and uh, uh, iPhone. You might have a really strong feeling like, oh, I love uh, iPhones. Everyone around me uh, thinks that... Um, uh, I should get an iPhone. It seems like people I value value iPhones. So attitudes and norms are in place, but it's like, I just don't have the money. I have to buy something cheaper from the Android uh, family. So here there might be something where it's like, I can't, right? And often this I can't is not so much like a financial uh, obstacle, but it is something psychological that we <coughs> lack the ability or the resources to perform the behavior. So there's another obstacle that has to be overcome in order for the attitude to predict the behavior. Um, one thing I will not talk about very much in this whole of that, um, uh, of this module because I don't have time, but next year, if you come to my third year elective, we would talk about it a lot. It's like this kind of the gap between the attention and the behavior, right? Um, this is what some of my research as a PhD student was about, something I'm really interested in, but it's basically when people say, I want to do X, I think it would, I want to exercise more, I want to eat healthier, I want to study more, I want to be a nicer person, and yet, 
we fall short of this behavior, right? This is often called the intention behavior gap. And this is the area of self-control. We talked about this is where Walter Michel would come in and his ideas about the marshmallow. This is a really important connection, as you can see about all these uh, many, many findings that show us that self-control is such a valuable predictor of all good things in life. And this is the reason that just having good intentions, right, is often not enough. You need some self-control strategies in order to get there. And I think um, uh, uh, most of you, I bet everyone will understand what I mean if I feel like, okay, I want to study. I know I can study. I know my parents and all the people around me would approve if I would study. I studied in the past, right? I can study. Uh, so all the things are in place. I will study. And then it's Monday morning at nine o'clock and you do everything but study, right? Um, perfectly human, perfectly normal. But this is what we talk about when we talk about the intention behavior gap. This is the realm of self-control or self-regulation or willpower, etc. Um, so let me come back and close this chapter with uh, the Lapierre study. And we will connect this in the beginning of the next, our next um, um our next session, our next, uh, like on, on racism and prejudice and stereotypes, right? Sometimes, not in this study, this is like perversely the opposite, but often nowadays, if we want to measure the attitudes towards something, people might feel like because of social desirability, because of the political climate, they are not willing to admit to themselves or to others, the real attentions and attitudes, right? So if I would kind of say somebody who's like kind of secretly racist, hey, do you think that white people are better than black people, right? Uh, then this person might either feel like, oh, I shouldn't. Uh, I don't think I'm that kind of person. And then they say, hey, no, but they might actually feel quite differently about it. And this is basically where we start next week when we talk about this, like how can we kind of get a handle on measuring attitudes without or with circumventing um, kind of um, uh, uh, social desirability and the lack of insight people have into their own behaviors. And this is the advent in the a, uh, late 90s, mid to late 90s of the so-called implicit measures, uh, the implicit association test you might have heard of. Uh, that is what it tries to explain. More on that next week. And I'll stop here with this chapter.